Welcome to the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee's 10th meeting of 2019. Before we move to our first item in the agenda, can I remind everyone to switch off their mobile phones as they may affect the broadcasting system. So, the first item on the agenda is for the committee to decide whether to take agenda item 5 in private. Are we agreed? Yes. Thank you. And the second item on the agenda is to hear from the Scottish Land Commission on the current work programme, and I am delighted to welcome, for, for the first time in my convenership, uh, Hamish Trench, the Chief Executive, and Andrew Thin, the Chair of the Scottish Land Commission. Good, good morning to you both. Um, I'm going to uh, start by asking you about your public meetings that you've been holding. Um, can I ask, first of all, what the key themes have been on, on, on these meetings? And, and, and a, you know, a secondary question about how they've maybe differed in theme between urban and rural locations. Well, that was going to be the first part of my answer. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, I mean, they are different, although strikingly. Um, so, as you would expect, in rural Scotland, uh, they are mainly rural themes. They are um, predominantly about power, um, uh, the, um, the balance of power, the use of power, um, often about uh, the way in which uh, communities are or are not engaged in decision-making, which is a theme that this parliament has returned to many times. Um, housing, rural housing, uh, uh, access to land for housing, um, and access to, to land for, for, for communities to purchase for other, other, other reasons, amenity and so on. In urban Scotland, interestingly, we actually get asked a lot about rural issues. Urban Scots care about rural Scotland and they care about what's happening in rural Scotland. So the same issues around power in particular come up, scale and power come up again and again in urban Scotland. But in addition, urban, in urban Scotland, um, and it varies a little bit depending on which bit of urban Scotland, but vacant and derelict land is a, is a major theme as one might expect, we have a very high proportion in Scotland of vacant and derelict land. Um, many communities resent the fact that they live next to vacant sites and derelict sites, and they want to know what we're going to do about that, and they want to understand. Um, and, and I suppose the last thing that's common to all the public meetings, and is partly why we hold them, it, it, this is about hold, us being held to account, and, 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 we, and, and we are challenged. You know, why have you prioritised this? Why have you prioritised that? That's a good thing. Um, and that's partly why we do it. Do you get a sense when you have these meetings that there's an understanding of what the Land Commission has done up to this point and what land reform actually means for these communities? Do you get a feeling that they, they're, they're switched on to what, what their rights are? Uh, yes and no. Uh, <laughs> many Scots are very well informed about land reform, very passionate about land reform, and that's probably why they've chosen to come to the meeting. You'd expect that. Um, it is an issue that certainly many, many Scots are uh, um, very thoughtful about, and I think that's why it has uh, a degree of political um, weight. This Parliament's returned to it a number of times since it was created in 1999. Um, but many people who come to these public meetings are simply interested. Uh, they'll, um, so so we, we, we use social media extensively, we write to all the community councils, all this sort of stuff. So a lot of people come because they're inquisitive and they're not well informed. And in particular, in urban Scotland, I don't think... So, so people kind of understand that in rural Scotland there are issues about big estates and community ownership and so on. Many urban Scots do not recognise that, that land reform is of social, a huge social and economic importance to them as well. And, and we've got to deal with that and get and get bridge that. Okay, I can see that. So um, you've been having all these public meetings. How is the what's been discussed by, by yourselves and the public in these meetings going to inform the work of, of, of the Land Commission? Um, yeah, I mean, we, we find these meetings very useful, actually, in kind of taking the temperature of local issues, understanding how the issues are playing out on the ground in different places. So sort of the experience that we take back from the discussions we have then informs um, the work that we're putting together. So, for example, the work we're doing around land ownership, and um, we made some recommendations last year on community ownership, um, informed by uh, not just the research that we've done, but by the discussions held in the public meetings as well. Um, and the same as same the case with forthcoming research around, around land ownership. And then particularly on urban engagement, um, this links very strongly into work that we're doing in partnership with SURF, the Urban Regeneration Forum, uh, about community engagement in urban areas and land use decision making. 
Uh, we've done some work over the last year with Young Scott and SURF looking at uh, how people are feel, feel able to engage in decisions affecting their, their surroundings, their place in urban centres. Um, so a lot of what we take from these meetings kind of links in with, with that wider work programme um, and helps us, helps us shape that. Yeah. Um, um, you mentioned that obviously the people that come to these meetings are the ones who are already interested. So have you had any thought as to how you can maybe have more meetings that maybe just reach into the communities and people who you feel could benefit from knowing a little bit more about what you're doing and getting more involved? We've thought about this a huge amount. Um, Two in yeah. this committee. Um, there's a couple of things I'd like to say on that. Uh, the, the first is, uh, um, it isn't the case that only people who, they, it's only the well-informed who come to these meetings. Many people come to these meetings, as I said, just simply because they're inquisitive. So that's a really good thing. Um, but I, of course, that's a very slow drip drip. Um, so um, in the year ahead, uh, or the two years ahead probably, we are going to change gear slightly. And increasingly, while we will, the public meetings need in part to be about us being held to account. That's important. So um, I don't want to lose that. Um, uh, because I think it's a good, really good discipline for us to be challenged around our priorities and everything else. Um, but I think increasingly we will, we, will, we will make the public, some of the public meetings about specific topics. Um, that will enable us to target the promotion, but it will also, I think, catch interest in a way that if you say, come to a meeting about land reform, a lot of people just yawn. If you say, come to a meeting about affordable housing, or if you say, come to a meeting about um, turning that derelict area into a park, You'll, you, you, people will come. So, so that, that, that there will be a shift. You'll see a shift in the next 12 to, to 24 months. Um, uh, but it'll be a, it's not going to be a switch. It's going to be a shift. We'll evolve. Thank you. I'd like to move on to, unless anyone else wants, Mark, do you want to come in? Just, just a quick thought on, on the back of your, your answer there. Um, obviously, there, there is quite intense discussion in urban communities about housing and about development and derelict land, and it's part of a local development planning process. So I'm just wondering how, how you can sort of align to those very active debates in communities, because often, sometimes those debates don't fully look at the context um, which some of the development pressures or opportunities um, present themselves. <coughs> Yes, and I think that's where we, we do and we need to keep working through other existing networks and tap in through local authority networks, community planning networks, uh, and particularly working with organisations like uh, SURF and DTAS, the Development Trust Association. Um, these are organisations uh, that are already building up those networks within um, urban communities in particular. Um, so I think this, is, this goes beyond our public meetings. Um, we, we will continue to do that, but at the same time we need to be working through some of these existing networks. Um, and some of, the, some of the work we've done over the last year with Young Scott, for example, and SURF starts to introduce, starts to ask some questions about how engaged people are in relation to land use decisions, um, what changes they would like to see coming through and how we can feed that through into the work we're doing, whether on vacant and direct land or actually more generally about uh, access to land for, for housing or community facilities. Okay, thank you. I'd like to move on to talk about some of the, uh, the papers that you've commissioned, the independent papers you've commissioned. Um, just, I, I, I guess, stimulate debate, but also to, you know, inform the, the future work of, of the Land Commission. There's one particular, um, the discussion paper on housing, the housing land market. And uh, I'll just quote from it. It says that reliance on the private sector has led to an undersupply of housing and escalating housing costs. Are you are you in general agreement with that that statement? Is there anything you'd like to say? We've, I'm interested to know how these discussion papers are actually filtering through your organisation and, and what you're taking from them. Yeah, um, well, the discussion papers are. <clears throat> So the discussion papers are, are there um, precisely to stimulate debate, to raise ideas. Um, they don't pretend to provide the immediate answers, but they are there to, to stimulate the right questions in a way that we then want to work with um, stakeholders on. The, the housing land market one, I think, is an interesting one that actually sits very well with one of the other papers we published around public interest-led development. And then the two of them together have helped stimulate a debate um, with local authorities, with the housing sector, and with the planning and development sector around how we actually make much more proactive use of the public bodies in, in delivering um, good development in the right place. 
and, and this is as much about culture change as it is about legislation. Um, so, so those papers have fed into work that we're now um, started to take forward research in relation to land value capture. Um, we're also doing some work at the moment on land banking. Um, and having stimulated these issues, it allows us to home in on, on precisely where the, the, the research requirements are um, that then allows us to, to move forward with those partners and actually reaching some ideas and recommendations. So, for example, on the housing land market over the course of this year, we'll be taking forward that research um, and expect in, in about a year's time to be coming back with some ideas and recommendations on potential reform of housing land market. Okay. And guess from the, from the perspective of you know, your ordinary Scott, um, and you mentioned that the scale of land ownership was something that's come out in your public uh, meetings as well. Does the Commission consider that maybe a, a look at a sort of statutory intervention in terms of public interest grounds might be something that you might be looking at? Well, um, I mean, the short answer is we've got an open, completely open mind on anything. So, so the short answer is, is yes, of course. I think it'd be, we would be pretty remiss if we closed our minds to things. But we are, we are very anxious to be evidence-led. So we will, go, we'll, we'll go into things thoroughly um, before we just start producing conclusions. Um, the one thing I think that's worth adding to, to on this particular subject is that um, Scotland. Scotland sits in an international context, and lots of other countries are, are grappling with these issues too. Um, I, th I do think it's important that we don't start trying to reinvent wheels here, that we look abroad, um, particularly to the continent of Europe. Um, and quite a bit of our research is now doing that, including around all of this. Interesting, you said that um, yeah, people in urban areas are very interested in what happens in rural areas as well. And if you mentioned looking looking to the continent, there are quite a lot of countries for which the people in urban areas have access to the countryside as well. You think that's an important theme that the people in the urban areas have that access to, to their own natural capital, I suppose. I think, I mean, people tell us that all the time. There's no question of that. And, and it's partly why this parliament has legislated uh, in the past, for example, on access rights. Mm -hmm. um, which is reflecting what the people of Scotland want. Um, what, what, what I think we need to work harder at, though, is, 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 is helping people to know how things are done in other countries. Um, it, is, but it is a feature, I think, of some of this discussion that um, sometimes the discussion is a wee bit insular. We do say, oh, well, this is the way Scotland does it, and this is the way it's always been done, so this is the way we do it. Well, actually, in Germany we do it differently, or in Denmark we do it differently, uh, or in Holland we do it differently. And I think understanding that and learning from that and being outward facing will help us here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Claudia, you want to come in? Um, uh, good morning to you both, um, and welcome to the committee. Um, could I ask uh, one of the discussion papers just to continue on the, um, to develop the discussion that the convener has started? Um, one of them, land for the many, not the few, limitations on the scale of land ownership, states um, that, and I quote, for many, the current concentrated ownership patterns represent a structural inequality in Scotland of significant proportions, which arguably limits or acts against furthering the development of greater social justice. Um, and I wonder if you could develop um, the, the points that you raise in that paper and in the experience of concentrated land ownership a little bit more for us as a committee. Yes. Um, if I could perhaps say, say a word about how we've developed some of that work around concentration of land ownership. Um, having published the discussion paper um, last year, um, we also picking up Andrew's theme there of actually looking internationally at how other countries deal with these things. We commissioned some research to look at international experience on interventions in managing land ownership. Um, and that was published uh, about a year ago, looking at uh, a range of countries, both in Europe and more widely. Um, and that found that actually it's quite common practice in many countries around the world to have interventions to address public policy issues uh, in, in determining essentially who can own how much land and, and sort of what, what kind of obligations there are around that. Um, so having looked internationally, um, we then um, held a public call for evidence um, uh, in, on the issues relating to scale and concentration in land ownership. Uh, and we had over 400 responses to that um, last year, a very good set of responses and a, a rich set of information there. Um, and actually, we will be publishing a report um, this week. In fact, tomorrow we'll be publishing uh, a report that results from that work 
um, on the scale and cost, on the issues uh, associated with scale and concentration of land ownership, um, picking up those themes. Thank you. And uh, could, could you say if there's um, been any evidence or information that's leading you towards some uh, uh, further thoughts on whether there should be an absolute limit on the scale of ownership? And if so, if there's been views expressed as to what, um, without going into too much detail, but what, what that limit should be and why? Um, we'll publish a lot of detail tomorrow, and it's difficult to give you it all now. There's a lot of detail. But leave well, it well, no, it no I'm quite happy to deal with the main issue. The main, so the main the issue is, is this about scale or is it about something else? Um, I think in, this is a broad answer, more detail, when we, that, that you can read the whole thing. I'm going to but But in, in broad terms, we're pretty clear that this is not about you know, 5,000 acres or 10,000 acres. It's not about that. It's about power. It's about monopoly uh, in some situations. Uh, it's about constraints on power, where, uh, which is actually quite a normal... If you think about any other aspect of the economy, we, we don't allow um, oligolop oligolopoly or monopoly to develop. Um, we have constraints on it. Um, it's unlikely that some sort of rather blunt tool that says 5,000 acres is the limit or whatever, it's unlikely that that would deal with the issue because the issue isn't 5,000 acres, the issue is about power. Um, so I think we need to think about this uh, in a more intelligent way, but that sounds a bit unkind, but in, in, a, in a more thoughtful, in a more subtle way. I, I, I think just set, setting lim arbitrary limits is unlikely to deal with the issue. So could, could I just um, ask you, I, either of you generally, about the issue around what you've highlighted several times about power, that um, it's argued by some that um, it's about how the land is managed, not who owns it, that matters, whereas others would say that, um, that it's who owns it, because in fact the landowner can say no in the end. And I'm just wondering if much of that sort of dialogue has come up in urban and in rural Scotland. It, it has, and I might, maybe we might both answer this one. Um, just cr cr crudely speaking, it, uh, it, it is about power, and power is about ownership. It's, it, uh, and I think it's important you can't separate them. But do you want to add a wee bit to that, Naomi? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's, it's very clear in, in what we've seen, both in terms of the evidence that's come to us over the last year, and in fact in the, the discussions that we have in the public meetings around the country, that ownership and use of land are inextricably linked. Um, and it comes back to the, the power of decision-making that ownership uh, conveys. So, so for us, the, the two are, are linked very closely together. And just finally, um, from in, in, in the questions I'd like to uh, pose to you, um, has, has rural depopulation come up as one of the um, issues in relation to power? And that does connect back with our convener's question about um, housing, but, but does go into a lot of other economic issues, obviously. It does come up in, uh, 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 in public meetings, uh, particularly uh, in the north uh, of the country. But actually, it comes up in public meetings in, 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 in urban Scotland too. People, pe people are anxious about what they perceive to be depopulation, uh, often in the past. And the population on the whole, on the whole in Scotland, the population in Scotland uh, is rising. Um, so we, we mustn't get this, this issue out of proportion. But, but clearly, if if you own a very large area of land, and in doing so, that gives you the power to determine whether houses can be built, jobs can be created, or anything else, then you have con you potentially have power over what happens to the population. Could, could I add to that? I mean, we certainly see the work that we're doing around housing and development being um, directly related to the challenge of depopulation and, and addressing rural repopulation in particular. Um, and I suppose I would just highlight that I suppose the work we're doing there are, there are two angles to that in, in relation to housing. One is around the ownership and, and reducing the constraints around ownership to the release of land in the right place at the right price. Um, and the other work stream really is about land values and how we make sure that land values are, are shaping that effectively uh, and, again, not preventing development happening in the right place where it's needed. Um, John Scott. Um, thank you. Uh, Convener, um, I, I think... Uh, confusing two issues here, the difference between access and ownership. Um, I agree that in the first Land Reform Act in 2003 gave access, to people, which I think was a huge success. Um, with ownership comes responsibility. Uh, and um, I'm not quite saying it, but you're managing to imply that um, landowners in Scotland are responsible for the depopulation of Scotland. I think it might... Well, well, well perhaps you would... 
cleared me or advised me on that point, but that seemed to be the kind of direction of travel because by exercising power inappropriately through their ownership of that land, they were somehow responsible for the depopulation of areas of Scotland that are being depopulated. I find that um, offensive, declaring an interest as a farmer, a very minor landowner, but notwithstanding, I find that offensive to those who I know who are landowners, and I'm surprised to hear that implication. Further in, your, in the notes here, you are uh, essentially talking about willing buyers and willing sellers, so I presume from what you're saying that you foresee the end of that, um, there being willing buyers and willing sellers with regard to the exchange of um, purchasing of land in Scotland. Uh, you, you seek to control that process. Hey, well, let me deal with the population first. So I, I absolutely, I'll be absolutely clear. I certainly did not say and would not say that landowners are responsible for the depopulation of Scotland. What I did say was that clearly if you do own a large amount of land and if as a consequence you have power over housing and power over employment, then you potentially have power over population and depopulation. Whether, how that is exercised, of course, is another matter. Um, but the, I think... I think there will be instances throughout history where landowners have contributed to, to population growth and population fall. So how far back are we going here then throughout history, you see? Um, what are we going back to? I mean, are we not well, I'm simply making a point. I'm not, going back in, I'm not going back anywhere. I'm simply making what I think is a logical point, which is if you, if you have that power, then that is what potentially can happen. Um, that's all. I'm, that's the only point I'm making. I also did say, and I'll say it again. Actually, the population of Scotland is broadly rising in almost all uh, parts of the country. Yet you're somehow managing to imply I'm not that implying. this power is being improperly used. That the ownership of land gives to the landowners. Yeah. Well, let me be clear. I'm not implying one way or the other. I'm simply saying that the power exists, and it is for. It is therefore there is a, and I made the analogy with other parts of the economy, where where monopoly power exists, um, we have to decide whether we wish to regulate the use of that monopoly power. Can I bring in Mark Ruskell? Uh, I mean, obviously you're, you're considering very important questions around economic participation, um, but but I wanted just to sort of come back to a conventional economic argument, if you don't mind, perhaps a bit odd coming from me, but and that's around economic productivity. Are you looking at economic productivity from land and what opportunities there might be through more diverse ownership models? Is that an issue or is the current system that we have the most economically productive that we can have? Um, I, I don't think we would assume that the current system is necessarily the most productive and our, you know, we, we've deliberately put a, an emphasis, a strong emphasis on productivity in the objectives for, for the Land Commission's work um, alongside diversity and, and accountability uh, in land ownership and use. And certainly our, you know, our sense of productivity, it is, it is certainly strongly about economic productivity, um, but it's also about the wider public value that we get from our land. So it is about the social and cultural value and environmental value that we, we get from land alongside the economic value. Um, I think uh, increasingly, whether, whether it's in urban Scotland or rural, actually, we, we should be open to question um, the, the model of economic productivity. Um, in terms of getting more out of the land use. And certainly there are elements of that that come through in the evidence um, that we've taken over the last year, um, particularly around scale and concentration of ownership, um, both in terms of uh, economies of scale uh, and potential different models as well. Okay. Probably in the back of the, the comments that, that John Scott has made, I'm, I'm a bit concerned that it, that's been highlighted as well, that the power that landowners have to influence rural depopulation or otherwise. Is it really significant if you take into consideration the powers that local authorities have to, um, through their planning policies, to indicate where housing is allowed or not allowed, or, or local authorities' uh, investment in uh, economic development? Is that, far, is that not far more significant when it comes to rural depopulation or housing rather than uh, actually landowners deciding whether they should have houses or not. I, th I think what's very, <clears throat> I think what, <clears throat> excuse me, what's very clear to us is that it is a, it is a system that requires all these parts of the jigsaw to be playing their part in order to actually deliver housing where it's needed. Um, so no question that the planning system has a crucial role to play, 
and actually we've identified in some of the work we've done over the last year that you know there are some questions around the role that planning plays in shaping land values etc and, and, and the proactive role that we can play through planning to make these things happen more quickly equally i think it's also clear from the evidence that ownership does play a part in that as well and we have to we have to sort of match up the the willingness and the ability to release land in the right place um, with the with the planning system uh, with the right land value uh, approach as well so what would you say suggest would you suggest is the most significant local plans uh, that local authorities put in place are actually barriers that landowners put in place I, I'm not sure I can answer that because I'm, I'm aware of many sites that uh, are zoned for planning that, that are not being built out there are clearly other constraints beyond planning and two questions from Angus MacDonald Okay, thanks, um, convener. Um, just uh, for the record, I, I should refer members to my register of interests. I, I own a, a non-domestic property in the Outer Hebrides, uh, which is situated within an estate that's uh, subject to a community uh, buyout attempt, uh, and it's at a sensitive stage. So, yes, yeah, just for the record. Um, if I could turn to um, the SLC's uh, strategic priorities for 2018-21. Uh, which um, you know we, we know the, the the remit is to to build on on existing land reform legislation and the work of the LLRG. Um, now there were four priority uh, work areas identified. Uh, one which comes under the REC uh, committee, uh, uh, agricultural holdings, uh, and the remaining three were land for housing and development, land ownership, and land use decision making. So, um, how, how were the commissions? strategic priorities decided upon and, and which areas were considered but not included? Um, so I, um, I have to try and answer this because Hamish wasn't there <laughs> until the latter part of the stages. Um, the board was established in December 16. Uh, we conducted a, a very large number of public meetings all over the place. Um, a lot of people came, a lot of people had priorities. Uh, out of those, distil we, we distilled those four. Um, uh, we then discussed them with government, of course. Um, but those were th those were the four that came through from all those public meetings. Um, there were a lot of people who, who who undoubtedly would like us to 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 be focusing on other things, but we, you know we have to prioritise. Okay, and when you are considering these priorities, um, is consideration or will consideration be given? to reserve matters uh, as well as the potential impacts yeah. um, of a UK exit from the EU if it happens? Uh, yes. Okay. And um, would you say that the guidance and the, the codes of conduct um, are or will be sufficient to, to deliver real progress uh, on the ground in areas such as promoting a culture of inclusivity, uh, collaboration and accountability? I think it's really important to say that we do not see land reform as being primarily uh, or exclusively uh, a legislative matter. It is fundamentally a cultural shift that's needed here, and that's why we've put so much emphasis on uh, developing protocols and so on and so forth. We we don't know what the answer to your question is, but um, uh, uh, but we think we should we should we should we should find out, which is why we're going to do this. What we do know and I was very much involved in it, is that when we put agricultural uh, uh, um, codes of conduct in place for agricultural holdings, uh, guidance and so on, that sector has responded really well. Landlords, land agents and tenants in the agricultural sector have responded really well. And many, many people in that sector say that they are in a much better place now than they were three years ago. So we do know that it, that it can work. Whether it will work everywhere and in all circumstances, we'll need to find out. And we may well be back here in a while to, to, to try and tell you what we've found out. Okay, um, that's good good to hear, uh, Convener, particularly given the evidence that we took in the run-up to the Land Reform Bill in uh, 2016. Thank you. And we've on to questions from John Scott. Thank you, uh, Convener. Um, the Scottish Land Commission's programme of work 2018 to 21 states that the Commission's role combines leadership and non regulatory culture change with statutory functions to review and advise on legislative and policy change. A moment ago, you said that cultural shift was your main emphasis, yet your 
role as defined by government appears to suggest that it's to review and advise on legislative and policy change. Where's the balance in, in that? Where, where is the emphasis? And you said it was essentially a cultural shift, but it appears to be different from from the information I've been given. I just, I'm not sure that that's what I said. Um, so what I said was that what's required, what needs to happen in Scotland, uh, is there needs to be a cultural shift. Uh, I think that's and, and that's a message that comes home again and again and again at public meetings. That's what people are looking for. And how that cultural shift is delivered will will be will depend on a number of factors. Some will be legislation, some will be codes of practice, and all the rest of it. We we actually just don't know at the moment how easy it will be to to to, to achieve that. The, I don't have the act in front of me, but the the the. The, the job of the land commissioners is to advise government, but it is also to advise and, pro and produce guidance for others, which is where the protocols come in. Um, and turning now to your programme of work, um, what key changes were made to the programme of work between September 2017 and March 2018? I think, um, I think you're probably referring to this, this time last year, we, we updated the programme of work um, at the start of the financial year. Um, that really was reflecting the point we'd got to. 2017 was obviously an establishment year for the Commission. It was the first year it was established. We were putting together the staff team, doing the initial work and, and getting the initial priorities underway. Having done that, it gave us much greater focus on the, the key issues to address um, from March 2018 onwards, which is where the programme of work uh, was updated. Um, and I think particularly that led us through the work we've delivered over the last year, focusing on looking at international experience in land ownership and land value taxation, uh, looking at historic experience on land value capture, um, and focusing particularly on the, the research and recommendations on community right to buy, which we made in November of last year. So those things kind of were the, the main focus for our work over the last year. Can I ask, was the initial programme of work over-ambitious, given that it was reviewed after six months, I mean, have, have the skills and experience of Scotland's research community been insufficient to carry out the work specified? Um, are, are the gaps in knowledge and understanding? No, we've always made it clear that the programme of work will be updated probably every six months or so. We've not been rigid about it. It's really important that we, ad up, that we adapt and, sh and, 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 and evolve our thinking as we learn. Uh, as, uh, as we learn where the priorities are. So uh, I would expect us to publish a revised programme of work roughly every six months. Uh, I see. Um, no, and I stress revised, not a new one, not a different one, but a one that is evolving with circumstances, in including evolving with what people are telling us. So every six months, a sort of rolling update. Right. Okay. How, how will the Commission approach areas where there is little or no consensus about a way forward? Can stakeholders be compelled to engage with you? No. No. Well, that's clear. <laughs> well, and will the Commission highlight examples of poor land management and ownership practices and identify individuals who are considered not to be working collaboratively with either the SLC or, or local communities? Um, I think we, we see this as part of the broader picture on supporting good practice in land rights and responsibilities. So that, that involves identifying good practice and establishing expectations about what normal, reasonable, expected behaviour is, um, but also being willing to call out examples of bad practice and poor, poor examples where we see that. Um, so that's very much the approach that we're taking with, for example, the protocols on community engagement um, and offering to, to support and advise on ensuring that good practice um, becomes the, the norm. So, okay, in can I just add? John, if you wouldn't mind, um, so Parliament has asked us on agricultural holdings. It put in place a very specific process with with codes of practice, with uh, 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 allegations of breaches, and so on. So, there's a process already been put in place by Parliament for, if you like, calling out uh, bad practice in relation to agricultural holdings. And um, we'll have to see what we can learn from that, but it may well have applicability more widely. We don't know yet. I'm a bit naive about the common or the current jargon of calling out. What do you mean by calling out examples of poor practice and, and good practice? So if there's a code of practice, for example, in place as to how you should conduct a rent review, and if you don't follow that code of practice, um, then 
a breach maybe of the code may be alleged to the commissioner, the tenant farming commissioner. The commissioner may then investigate and may, if he wishes, publish his findings. All right. And so you would expect to highlight good and bright practice or, or just bad practice? Well, the, the, Parliament, the, the process that Parliament's put in place is to allege breaches of the code. I see. But, but I would add more, more widely, we are deliberately um, promoting examples, case studies of good practice, um, not just on the agriculture side, but for example, in community engagement. Um, there is a you know, wide, wide range of support there, including examples, case studies of good practice, because actually that's the most effective way of sharing what's, you know, what, what should be normal. I would think that's to be recommended, yes, that good practice, dissemination of good practice would be probably much more valuable than highlighting bad practice. But okay. that's a personal point of view. Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, could I turn our, our mind specifically to the land use strategy in relation to your work? And um, as you'll know, but just for the record, the 2016 Land Reform Act specifically includes the land use strategy as a matter that the Commission can review and recommend changes to, and uh, which I didn't know until recently, but uh, have taken a keen interest, as has a previous convener, Graham Day, and others in the um, previous um, committee in the last session of the Parliament. Um, so um, do, you, do you have any plans to um, review the effectiveness of the land use strategy um, as a whole? And this is something that's also been highlighted by um, Environment Link. Yeah, um, I mean, we, we don't have a plan to do a formal review of the land use strategy, but it is something that we are continually talking with stakeholders and government about in terms of Im implementing the current land use strategy. Um, and I think the, it, it, it comes across again as a, a strong theme, actually, in, in many of the discussions we have over the year, that the, one of the core issues is around participation in land use decision making. Um, and whether it's in public meetings or, or some of the other research work carried out, um, undoubtedly we see um, opportunity to improve uh, the ways in which particularly local communities and, and people are able to engage in decisions about land use uh, in their surrounding area, and particularly in relation to land use change. Um, so I think that's where we see a particular role for the land use strategy um, in improving perhaps regional and local level decision making mechanisms, um, where actually you know, bringing to a head uh, choices and understanding about land use choices, trade-offs and, and priorities. Um, and ensuring that there is a wide range of views influencing uh, and, and feeding in and understanding those decisions. And could, could I ask um, you if, if you've looked specifically um, either in relation to the land use strategy or in, in the wider remit that you have, going, which does go back to the programme of work, but um, in relation to um, how we use land in the battle against climate change. And there's been a lot recently about um, concerns about driven grass moors, for instance, which just to highlight one, one issue and protection of peatlands as well. And I wonder um, if, if any of those issues are forming part of your considerations. Not specifically. We're not, we, we, we don't at the moment have plans to do any specific reviews in relation to those. However, those subjects do uh, are integral, actually, to a lot of our other work, particularly the issue about community involvement in decision-making. In many of the public meetings in rural Scotland, what people tell us is that they would like to participate in decision-making about the management of grouse moors, for example. And some of those people do so because they are anxious about climate change, others are anxious about wildlife, uh, others are anxious about jobs. Um, you would expect all, 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 all of that. Um, a lot of this will, I think, if, if we can get the... We've, we're developing protocols, we're developing guidance, we're developing good practice case studies, all the points that have just, just been made around community involvement and decision-making. And if that can happen, I think people will feel a lot more comfortable. It's the, dis, the sense that people are unable or powerless that is, that is frustrating a lot of people. Thank you. Move on to questions from Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you very much, Convener. And before I uh, do so, uh, let me declare that I have a, jointly with my wife a three-acre registered agricultural holding. Um, and I use that to illustrate some of the issues around owning land, uh, particularly in rural area. Um, if I were to sell this uh, three acres of hill grazing, I might get £5,000 for them. Um, on the other hand, they are an adjunct to a rural house where many householders want to keep horses, so therefore it probably adds to the value of the house by £20,000. 
if I could persuade, th 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 these figures are quite arbitrary and not to be questioned, it's the principle. And if I could persuade the local authority to prov provide uh, planning permission for four houses, it would probably be worth a quarter of a million or thereby. Now, the local authority, I hasten to add, have a policy that would mean it's an extremely distant prospect. It isn't going to happen. And that brings me to the role of, uh, of councils in, in relation to land and housing and uh, business development. Uh, in particular, uh, not my holding, which is not vacant or derelict, but vacant and derelict land. Um, has the commission been working with councils? Because I think that there's quite a view that uh, the price and availability of land is to some extent available, uh, determined by how much land councils choose to designate for housing developments and local plans. If they designated twice as much, if I was simple-minded, I would say the price would half. But of course, it's not quite that simple as uh, Adam Smith would remind us, I'm sure. So what has is, what is the Commission been doing with local councils, particularly vacant and derelict? But it does open up a broader issue. I'm not trying to open up the issue of land ownership, which will come later in our questioning. Yes, we, we are speaking with a number of councils, um, particularly around those issues, and obviously specifically in relation to vacant and derelict land, but also that leads into the broader questions about land value capture and the role of public bodies in, in brokering um, development, essentially. And I think from our point of view, there are, there are certainly two strands here. One, one is simply the, the planning system and the effective use of the planning system in zoning sufficient land uh, and actually the, the role of planning policies in shaping land values. But the other, I think, equally important one is actually the role that public bodies can play, including local authorities, um, in, in using their, their sort of power of brokerage and leverage to help uh, good development happen. Um, and this is back to the proactive role that um, planning authorities, local authorities can make um, in relation to funding infrastructure um, and unlocking development uh, in marginal sites. Certainly when looking at the vacant derelict land, um, local authorities, there are some great examples of local authorities making some of these sites happen in some very challenging circumstances. The role of the group that we've put together, the, the task force working with the government on this, is to actually learn the lessons from those and be able to, to make some of the changes to the system, whether it's in regulation, uh, finance or indeed planning, uh, that will unlock that in, in more sites across the country. Um, but I think I would also come back to the, the fundamental role that public bodies have to play in proactively brokering development. And, and again, looking internationally, uh, it's quite common for public bodies to play a role in land assembly, uh, facilitating infrastructure investment uh, through land value capture, and then returning sites to the private sector for development, um, or indeed taking a stake in a joint venture approach to development. And these are the kind of um, approaches that we, we think we should be exploring further here. A slightly cheeky question, but are you, are you aware of any significant housing development uh, which has not attracted uh, objections from adjacent uh, people. I'm not sure. <laughs> not sure I could answer that. Well, let me let, let me turn it this way. Um, the councils are clearly have a set of tools at their hand, but equally, although communities want more housing, they don't want them next to them in general terms. Is that, is that the sense you get from your consultation, your meeting of communities? Because, because there is that tension between the, the status quo and people who are there and this need to develop land. The, answer is, the short answer is yes, that is the sense we get at, at many, many public meetings. We hear from people who are desperate to see more land released for hiding. At quite a few public meetings, people turn up who want to tell us about a housing development that they think is, is wrong and that ought to be dealt with by the Land Commission. It, it takes us in some ways to the, to the fringes of our remit. The, uh, planning decisions are a democratic matter for local mm -hmm. authorities. And l local authorities not only have to decide about individual cases, but they have to produce strategic, strategic plans that are going to meet the needs of their community. Land, land reform, I think, is... is is, I wouldn't say separate because it's clearly integrated, but I think it is, it is a, an, an additional aspect ra rather than... The, the, but I accept that people will, will, people will always come to our, our public meetings who, 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 who hope that we might be able to solve their particular angst. 
Well, let me steer us back to vacant and derelict land and how are we doing on that subject to things like compulsory sale orders proving of value? Um, so, last year we, we put together a proposal for a compulsory sales order mechanism and there, there is, as I understand, a commitment to, to bring that um, into legislation. But, but that, I think it's important to say, is designed to tackle only a, a subset of sites. Mm. And it's really a subset where it, it is in those cases ownership that is a barrier and perhaps an unrealistic expectation of value that the owner is holding out for, um, where a compulsory sales order mechanism would, would shift the balance um, in, in the negotiation. Um, there are many other sites, as you'll be well aware, where actually the issue is, is simply financial viability and cost, um, including remedi remediation of vacant and derelict sites. Uh, so we're currently working with Scottish Enterprise and the Scottish Futures Trust um, in breaking down the, the vacant direct land register into essentially baskets of different types of site, um, because there will be very different solutions to, to different sites in there. There will be a subset that, that are marketable and can go through normal market channels. Uh, there will be many others that are actually suitable um, for um, community-led regeneration, uh, green infrastructure, uh, and there will be many others that actually require public intervention um, in order to bring those sites back. May, may, may I just intervene? I, I hear what you're saying, and I can't disagree with the word that you've said. But how are we doing in practice on vacant and derelict land? We are reducing the register by about 1.3% a year at the moment, which would take us 77 years at the current rate. So there is room for further improvement. There is the significant city. room for transformation. I, I, I must say I had a consistency case where there was a, a derelict house, well, perhaps even more than derelict, in one of the villages in the area I represented, uh, where it took us 10 years to get effective communication with a trust based in Panama, who would only deal with us if we communicated in Spanish, um, which cost my uh, office expenses budget quite a lot of money to do that. But successful outcome at the end of the day, I hasten to add. But, but it, we still don't know who actually owned it. So, Without opening up the issue of ownership, have we the tools where the ownership is uncertain that, that would help us in, in uh, particularly urban areas as well as uh, it, it, where it's vacant and derelict? I, sorry, I think I, I understand your point that ownership, identity of ownership and establishing an identity of ownership remains an issue for some of these sites. Um, clearly, the work that's currently underway in terms of transparency of land ownership in Rocky is designed to help address that, but, but at the moment it remains an issue. Carson. Hey, thank you. Um, according to the programme of work, there's uh, certain activities are scheduled to start this year. So could you provide us an update on the research into land assembly, um, the housing market and, and on land banking, and if, if, when it's due to commence, if it hasn't already commenced? Yep, um, so this is an ongoing process. Um, the work we've delivered over the last year um, is looking at a historic review of land value capture experience, um, learning the lessons from many previous attempts, particularly throughout the 20th century. Um, and then we've moved on to working with the Scottish Futures Trust to model particular options for land value capture that might work in different markets around Scotland, recognising that the different geographies and different land values inherent in that. Um, we will be publishing some, some initial work on that shortly in relation to um, to the planning bill looking at um, proposals around land value capture. But then going on from that, we've also commissioned um, just in the last couple of months uh, a review of land banking. Uh, again, an initial bit of work because I think what's important is that we actually understand what we collectively mean and think of as land banking. Um, we need to understand what do we mean by that, what are the types of what people call land banking, what are its implications and how prevalent is it. Um, and importantly, we've asked that, that bit of work to look in a rural context at rural towns and communities as well as the, the main urban context. Um, so from those building blocks, we'll then move on and over the coming year, um, we're scheduling a, a more formal review um, of options to improve the operation of the housing land market, drawing on that. Um, and we'd expect to be coming back with recommendations on that next year. Okay, my next, my next question was on what par parameters are you looking at, but I think you've answered that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. And Mark Ruskell. I just wanted to come back on um, one of the points I think emerged from Stuart Stevenson's question, and that's around the challenges that local authorities have, having identified a, a suitable site in the planning system for housing for new development, trying to assemble the right um, upfront infrastructure, be it schools or be it facilities for active travel or, or whatever, um, 
in that area to make a community sustainable from day one. And I'm, I'm just wondering, sort of in your, in your sort of thinking around what happens elsewhere, uh, perhaps around land value tax or other, other tools, are, are there ways that we can ensure that new communities, because we do need to see more housing, we will need to see more communities in Scotland, um, can be built in a way which is sustainable from, from day one? Because it does, I see a number of stalled sites, for example, in, in my own region, which have been earmarked for development years ago, but have never happened because, you know, the upfront money isn't there to, to really get them up and, up and running. Yes, I think a more proactive approach to, to land assembly is certainly key to this. So I think this, this brings together a number of bits of work that we're looking at. Um, first is land value capture, looking at how we actually use some of the value inherent in land to, to make that infrastructure um, investment happen. Um, but I also referred to the, kind of the role of the public bodies in this and the potential for joint ventures and different approaches. Um, recently we published some work looking at uh, how, uh, how public authorities in the Netherlands and Germany approach these issues. And it's quite common in other countries um, for public bodies to play a more active role in the land market, uh, either stepping in to assemble land where necessary or forming joint ventures with private developers to do that, using the land value to provide the infrastructure, um, and then either selling land on or continuing to play an active part um, as a joint venture partner. So I think there's, there's several approaches there that we're keen to explore further uh, in Scotland, um, not just around the, the, the land value capture and potential role of land value tax uh, in, in that, but also around the, the, the proactive role of public bodies uh, in land assembly mechanisms. And I'd, I'd fully expect <coughs> over the next year that we'll start to actually sort of model and, and test some of these potential options for la different land assembly measures. Okay. Uh, Mark, if you'd like to continue uh, yeah. your questioning on land ownership, please. Sure, if I could maybe um, change the tax slightly. Um, I, I mean, we've had a, a lot of discussion this morning around, you know, scale and concentration of land ownership, and I'm, I'm just wondering what, what the discussion has been like with the Scottish Government on these issues. Are there particular reforms that you're pushing? I mean, what, what, well, firstly, perhaps which bit of government are you talking to? I mean, is it environment? Is it... Kevin Stewart in, in planning and local government? Is it Fergus Ewing in rural? Is it, I mean, how do you engage with government and w what is the response to, to these issues that you're, that you're getting? Um, maybe we should both answer this. So in terms of how we engage with government, we, we report, as you probably know, uh, mainly to Rosanna Cunningham, but also for the agricultural stuff to, to Fergus Ewing. Um, so that's the, the formal line of reporting, and, and, and that's all the usual sort of um, regular meetings and briefings mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. But we do, because of the nature of the work, cut across into other, other areas, land value tax, for example. Um, so we have... Um, managed to establish communication channels with other parts of, of government. It is quite early days in terms of the dialogue on the specific points you raised, but I'll just pass to Hamish, she can tell you exactly where we are. Um, yes, I mean, the, the government in, in the programme for government, they, they asked a specific look at, first of all, community ownership, um, which we reported on in November last year, um, and secondly, um, issues associated with scale and concentration of ownership, which we'll be reporting on this week. So those were the, those were the two sort of headline um, asks from government. Um, we, as Andrew says, we report obviously directly the lead relationship is with, with the land reform policy team, but certainly at an operational level we have good connections across regeneration and planning, local taxation uh, and other Scottish government teams. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think that's clear then the recommendations will be out this week on land concentration and ownership. Yeah. Um, can I just ask then about the, the other strand that you mentioned, which was uh, community ownership. Um, where we are with the community ownership delivery group uh, that's been proposed. Um, do, do you know when that, that might happen? Which kind of interests will be reflected on that group? Um, I think I'll have to yeah. pass that to you. <laughs> yes, um, the Scottish Government is taking the lead on setting up that the community ownership leadership group, and I'm fully expecting that that will be up and running over the next month or two. Um, and it will certainly deliberately um, draw together representatives from, from different sectors. Um, so from land ownership, community development, um, planning sectors. I think part of the purpose of that group is it needs to be really cross-sectoral to bring together the different interests that are needed. Mm -hmm. um, and and that, that obviously you know, follows the, the direction of travel that um, we set out last year about community ownership needing to be a, a normal option for communities across Scotland mm -hmm. and be seen very much as a part of regeneration and community planning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, just a couple of uh, other quite specific questions as well, and it's about the the research into charitable and trust status uh, in, in land ownership. 
um, just where, where you're at with, with that particular form of research. Yeah, this, this year we've been carrying out some initial scoping work really to, to understand the nature of land ownership by trusts um, and I think it's important that we, we probably separate out private trusts and public and charitable trusts, uh -huh. um, different, different issues probably around both. Um, we've been doing some work and, and taking some legal advice on the, sort of the, the background and the context for those and again we'll be publishing a paper for a discussion uh, shortly over the next few months. And, and that's very much intended to stimulate discussion with the sector, uh, with the land ownership sector, with professional advisors, uh, and understanding the, um, the issues and the relationships around charitable and trust status ownership. Okay. And Finlay Carson. Does the Commission expect that the recently enabled uh, community right to buy abandoned, neglected and detrimental land will have a significant impact on the amount of land and community ownership? And will there be a difference between land owned uh, in rural areas and urban areas? I, I think it's, it, I mean, partly it is obviously too early to tell, but I, I suspect that that power will be used for relatively few specific sites. I mean, it, it, it is a, obviously a sort of a last resort mechanism. Um, and coming back to our recommendations on community ownership, certainly what we would like to see, and, and I think what is necessary for community ownership to become a, a more widespread normal part of the, the picture, is for the, the norm to be a willing buyer, willing seller negotiation. Um, and that is by far the most, the most productive, constructive and likely route to, to securing more community ownership. Okay. Given, given that there is an absolute right to buy in that instance, uh, how does that fit, fit in with the presumption for negotiated transactions between a willing seller and a willing buyer? Well, I, I think it's well established that the, actually both are part of the picture and, and it's quite right that there are backstop measures in place to provide communities with the ability to take action where they need to. Uh, that shouldn't prevent the normal practice being about willing negotiations. Okay, thank you. And finally, um, work on the proposed land value taxation. Um, given that there's, there, there's a recent paper um, found that there was a lack of evidence that land value taxes actually delivered the theoretical uh, benefits um, that are attributed to them, how is that progressing? The, the next phase of work on land value tax, I think you're referring to the, the, the work we published around international experience. Um, there are about 30 countries in the world that use some form of land value tax, so it is important we learn the lessons from that. Um, that, that research pointed to three areas that we'll be taking forward this year. Um, and the first of those is very specifically in relation to vacant and derelict land. Um, we don't know, but we want to investigate whether a land value tax could have a part to play in, in unlocking a subset of vacant and derelict sites. Um, the second is in relation more broadly to land value capture and particularly in relation to the housing market. Does land value tax have a role to play in, in that long-term approach to land value capture and reinvesting land value in, in making development happen? Um, and the third area is does land value tax have a role to play in increasing the diversity of land ownership? Um, so those are three areas that we've identified that we want to explore further. Uh, we'll be setting up a, an expert working group over the course of this year uh, to take overview of, of that land value tax work. Okay, when, when do you expect that report to be delivered? Expect that to be to be reporting about this time next year. Um, that's a substantial bit of work over the coming financial year. Okay, okay. I have a, a, a sub supplementary question to some of the things that Finn Carson's just mentioned around um, the willing buyer, willing seller. Um, yet, is there anything in place that where the w the willing buyer? Um, has got plans for particularly a, a derelict, but uh, not necessarily a derelict, an empty building, which would retain that building and use it for public good, versus the seller wanting to perhaps dismantle a you know a, a building and use it for something which is not necessarily um, in line with public good. Is, is there anything there that we need to be looking at? I mean, I'm, you can probably guess I'm actually thinking of a particular instance, but where something maybe isn't in line with things like um, uh, regeneration of a town or using that land for, 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 for public good, where, where does that leave communities which want to actually go in, take an asset and develop it for the good of the community versus other interests? I, I think in those kind of circumstances that it, it is probably the community right to buy for sustainable development that is likely to offer more scope um, and be a more, more useful mechanism. Okay. Um, the, the right to buy for abandoned and neglected land is, is clearly and deliberately designed for, for very specific circumstances um, and probably doesn't address those kind of use issues. 
Right. Is that something maybe that could be you know, looked at? Is that something that's come up in your public in engagement sessions, where people have very different views about the, the use of a particular uh, site? It, it, it does come up, and, 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 and I think it's very early days. I, we, we, we simply don't know how the, how the right to buy for sustainable development is going to work. Uh, um, very, very few cases really developing. Um, there may well be a legal challenge to it anyway. So I think we have to wait and see. I, 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 I think, as Hamish said, the vast majority of community acquisitions have and will, I think, take place through willing buyer, willing seller. And if we look at the international work that we did on this, it is the norm in a very large number of countries across uh, Europe that communities own or control in some way land round and about settlements. And, and as we try to move towards that kind of pattern, I, I would anticipate that most land, that landowners will be, will be willing sellers. I, um, but that is part of the cultural shift that, uh, and the behavioural mm. shift that I think needs, needs to happen. And, what I think is very helpful is highlighting, actually, what normal looks like in many other countries. OK, thank you. Um, John Scott, you want to ask a question uh, on this theme? I did, yes. Um, I just, I'm not quite all fair with all of this, but we'll, we'll I mean, there, in, across, particularly in Ayrshire, where I'm from, um, there are a lot of brownfield sites within um, villages and towns in Ayrshire. Uh, are these, uh, but ripe for redevelopment and, and housing, are these uh, available for community right to buy as well, or is it community right to buy essentially just for for rural areas? No, no, it's very much for urban uh, land as well, um, and certainly the the current operation of um, the Scottish Land Fund, I think, bears out that many of the many of the applications coming to the Land Fund at the moment are actually for urban sites, buildings, or, or urban plots. So, so both the rights to buy and the wider um, support for community engagement is very much focused on urban as well as rural uh, sites. My limited experience of, of Scotland would suggest that there might be more brownfield sites uh, uh, where there's neglected and derelict land than there are sites of that description in, in rural areas. Do you have a feel for that? I think certainly if, if we're talking about um, sites that are sort of officially on the vacant derelict land register, then those are generally sort of urban or town-based sites. But of course, the, the community right to buy is a, is a broader um, definition in relation to, to abandoned, neglected land. Um, I suspect there's quite a wide variation across, um, across rural towns and communities as well as, as urban centres, and certainly it's designed to apply to both. Well, forgive me for not knowing, is there a standard definition of what neglected and, and, and detrimental land is? I'm afraid I'm not going to try but and remember it. I would, I would no. have to, have there, to refer is to it the, the Is it the same for urban and rural, or is it different for urban and rural? I think in, in the way that, that um, those regulations work, it is it's obviously the same um, definition uh, in whatever context you're operating. But I would, I would have to refer, to the, refer, refer you to the guidance on, on that particular right to buy. Okay. Right, thank you. Stuart Stevenson. Um, just a quick on the willing buyer, willing seller. It is asserted quite regularly that the existence of compulsory powers as the backstop when there isn't a willing seller are often an incentive for a seller to become a willing seller and to engage in the process. Is, is there any evidence that you have to hand that sustains or shoots down that assertion that's made? It's one to which I've personally got some sympathy, but... I think it's almost certainly the case that there are instances where that is true, but I, 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 do, want, I, I do think it's wrong to see landowners as unwilling sellers uh, in this instance. I don't think that's the case. Uh, um, the, it, l the vast majority of landowners in Scotland have um, underst understand and have so far uh, cooperated. That's partly why we have so, you know, such a large amount of community land uh, already. I think going forward, what we've tried to set out in our report on this is that we actually maybe need to just refocus this whole business from the, the types of acquisitions that have taken place over the last decade or so and, and, and rethink that into a more, something more typical that, that we can learn from other parts of Europe, which is, as I say, 
land. Community ownership is not an end in itself. It has to be a means to some sort of end. And we need to be clearer, I think, about what, what are the ends that community is trying to achieve here. And we can learn an awful lot from other parts of Europe where community ownership, community control of land around settlements is, is the norm. Um, often ac acquired over the last two or three hundred years, it's not a, not necessarily a recent recent thing, but we can learn from that, and I think that will direct it. And I have seen no evidence to suggest that the majority of Scotland's landowners aren't going to be willing to participate participants in that process. Okay, Finley Carson. Just just a very quick one. Does does any of the work that you do highlight the issues where there maybe is a willing seller? Um, but because of the liabilities associated with a building or a piece of land. So the, the, the examples that spring to mind are Air Station Hotel and um, Stena, the old Stena East Pier in Sunra. So there may well be very willing sellers, but the liabilities associated with those pieces of land actually are a huge barrier to either local authorities or communities buying those. Is, is that something that um, can cause problems in the future? And do, can you suggest any solutions to, to those sort of situations? Um, uh, community ownership may not be the solution to those sorts of situations. I think that's the first point to make very, very clearly. We have to be clear what is the purpose of community ownership. It isn't just assault to take on problems. Um, I think that would be a real mistake, which is partly why we've emphasised this point. Not a means to an end... Uh, 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 sorry, not an end in itself, but a means to an end. Um, it, it, uh, Air Station, for example, it seems to me highly likely that the solution to that may not be community ownership. I don't, I don't know, but it seems unlikely. Um, the, the, there is a lot of work, I think, going on. The Land Fund have been really excellent in helping communities to figure out, well, what what is our purpose here? What is the end? What is our capacity? What is sensible here? But let's not underestimate the capacity of communities. There are some extraordinary examples of communities taking on and, and successfully developing and delivering a great deal more public value out of chunks of land than was, that was delivered before, and doing it very well indeed. So, but could the, the land bank, the land fund, be a limiting factor to communities' ability to take over? So again, maybe going back to properties and town centres that are not used that, that hinder the development of town centres, or specifically, you know, again, the, these pier in, in Stranraer, where there's a substantial financial burden associated with um, bringing that piece of land back into manageable use or whatever. So is that a limiting factor in the ability for communities to, to take ownership? Well, well, it's one, although, I, I mean, in the report we've emphasised that we, you know, the land fund has come along fairly recently. Prior to that, the vast, vast majority of community acquisitions were privately funded through crowdfunding, through philanthropy and all the rest of it, and we mustn't lose sight of that. Very, very important. If the public sector started to crowd out private funding, that would be extremely unfortunate. Um, but, but clearly, a community taking over something like the Stranraer Pier is partly a financial challenge, but it's more than just financial, it is capacity. And, and I, I do emphasise, let, let, it's horses for courses, let's not see community ownership as a solution to all our problems. Thank you. And we have questions from John Scott on the land use decision making. Thank you. Maybe before I do, I would just um, say that it's not yet the intention of um, uh, the people of AIR and AIR constituency, which I represent, to see um, the, the station hotel turned over to community use, at least as far as I'm aware. Um, can I just ask you now about land use decision making? And could you provide an update on the baseline research to establish appropriate measures, indicators of community involvement in land management decision making? Has this now been implemented? Uh, very, very simply, the, the answer on that specific issue is that that is work we are currently doing, so no, it's not implemented yet. Um, we've uh, focused recently on publishing the protocol for community engagement and getting the, the support around good practice in place. Um, we're conscious that we will be uh, asked to advise government in two years' time on the effectiveness of the guidance on engaging communities, uh, and, and that's what the baseline measures are being put in place for. Thank you. Uh, what impact has the land rights and responsibility statements and the guidance on engaging communities in decisions relating to land had and is expected to have? And what further clarity does the Commission expect to have to give on implementing the land rights statement. 
I think it's very early days in terms of impact, but but I think uh, um, the vast majority of landowners are well aware that uh, that they have responsibilities. You said it yourself earlier. Um, uh, I think the, the statement's been helpful in highlighting that. Um, the guidance has been helpful in in, in setting out a, a clear methodology, but I think it's some way from being widely understood why wide, uh, awareness is still quite low in terms of going forward we've just produced uh, a protocol on community engagement which builds on this further and attempts to provide people with you know clear simple guidance as to what would be sensible here so okay. it's early days i think is the short answer okay. thank you um, how does the commission intend to monitor the success of the newly published protocol on community engagement in decisions relating to land, does it apply equally to private and community landowners, regardless of whether they are urban or rural? Yeah, picking up the, the last point first, I mean, yes, I think we're very clear that the, the guidance and the expectations apply equally across all types of landowner, whether public, private, NGO, community, um, and equally the, the expectations are reciprocal um, on both those with the responsibility for managing and owning land, as well as those with, who are, who are you know, community and, and using land. Um, so this is very much about the understanding of the reciprocal expectations um, and how that should work. Um, going back to your, your first question, how we'll measure it, um, we have specifically identified in the in the protocol, we've specifically asked for feedback, both for examples of good and bad practice to, to be fed back to us. Um, but that will obviously also form part of the, the monitoring that we're putting in place. We, we're intending to, to use survey mechanisms with both communities and landowners and managers. Um, to establish uh, a, a measure and an ongoing measure of um, both awareness and, and effectiveness uh, of the guidance. You said you intend to use what kind of measures, Sterling? So, survey, survey measures, survey measures uh, sorry. predominantly, yeah. Sorry, thank you. Um, <clears throat> could you provide an update on the review of the costs and impacts of fiscal policy in relation to diversity of ownership and land use decision making that is due to commence in 2019? Uh, yes, that review hasn't, hasn't started yet. Essentially, we're in the position where I think a lot of our work over the last couple of years has identified, effectively scoped out a number of issues uh, where tax and, and fiscal policy, but particularly taxation, probably has a, an important part to play. Um, so over the coming financial year, um, we'll be pulling together a group to look at tax, including land value tax, as mentioned earlier, but I think importantly looking at that in the wider context of the existing tax regime um, and, and both looking at options for, for changes and what the implications, understanding the implications of those would be. So have the specifications and parameters yet been drawn up and the contracts awarded for this no, research not yet. Not yet, or no, not? No. no. Right. And finally, what aspects of economic, social and cultural human rights might be further realised by the Commission that are not or have not already been covered by this work programme? <laughs> it's hard. I'll have a go at the. Um, <laughs> I, I think we, we we see the human rights framework as being something that actually runs through all of our work. Um, it, mm -hmm. It's less of a work stream in itself, but it's about providing a frame and an influence that shapes much of our work. So, you know, in relation to the to realising economic, social, and cultural rights, uh, it is significantly around, for example, um, in practical terms, rights to to housing, to work, employment, um, etc. Um, so that influences, for example, the work we've done on putting together a capacity sales order proposal. It influences the work we're doing around land ownership. Um, it is a, a way, I think, of framing some of the issues that we're looking at, um, rather than being a, a topic all to itself. Um, Mr Thun earlier mentioned the risk of legal challenge to some of the stuff you're doing. Have you any specific areas where you expect legal challenge currently outstanding? No, not at the moment. I'd like to ask one final question of you, and, and I guess it comes back to full circle to public, the public. Do you feel that two, three years on from land reform going through Parliament, that there is enough guidance, straightforward guidance out there for members of the public who are perhaps maybe looking at uh, a part of their town, their village, whatever, that they feel that the community can benefit from. Do you feel there's been enough sharing of the, the guidance on the processes of how they can help communities? Is there enough uh, sharing of good practice where it's worked? 
I, I'm going from the, the point of view as, you know, thinking of myself as actually just a, a resident of a village and thinking, where would I start? Do you think that's something that may, needs to be looked at more? Um, so I think it would be, I don't want um, to imply any criticism of, 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 of the huge amount of effort that has gone into this. It, it, it is a huge, huge uh, challenge and a great many organisations, including government, but, out, but also including NGOs and Committee and Cotton, and all these bodies have, are, have and are doing a huge amount of work. So there's an awful lot that more there than there was two years ago. Is there enough? I very much doubt it. I think we, we, we all have to continue as part of the cultural shift, it's part of the dialogue shift. And it's, it's not just about guidance, it's about expectation. Yeah. It's about confidence, uh, it's about capacity. It's about a range of different things, and these things don't, you can't flick a switch. They take time. If I could add to that, I think, yes, there is actually quite a lot of technical guidance out there, but it is much more about the, the support and the capacity that's required. Yeah. And you know, as an example, we've been working with SURF recently in holding conversations in, uh, in Kirkcaldy, Rothsey, Govan, about, about engagement and community options there. And I think that just emphasises that this is, you know, this is a long process. It's not simply going in with a with a technical bit of guidance about how to use a particular right to buy is actually a more fundamental um, discussion with the community about their expectations and, and how those can be realised through a whole set of measures, some of which are land reform, some of which are far broader. Okay. Um, do my colleagues have any more questions? I don't believe we do. I want to thank you very much for your time this morning. I'm going to suspend this meeting briefly. <laughs>